administrative announcement and uh, encouragement to you and just to keep you awake for uh, this another hour. Uh, there is an idea offered by one of our Caesar um, people that uh, whoever will uh, ask a question to, in this discussion will get a gift, which is a Caesar t-shirt. <laughs> Four sizes, so uh, be quick with your questions so that you can select your size. Thank you. Yes, yes, I can, I can demonstrate. I won't be wearing them, but they are here. Yes, they are real. Uh, this is S, but uh, we have XLs as well, so don't worry. <coughs> to be the last one, but that's why I sat down here. Well, okay. Uh, so my name is uh, Krzysztof Jasen. I work at the university in Poznan, but I also, I'm also a CEO of a small enterprise called Poleng. The enterprise is a part of the PWN group. This is PWN, is the main publishers of traditional dictionaries, usually with, with Polish language. So our company was formed in 2004 in order to create a commercial version of machine translation system and the PWN hoped that the system would use the traditional dictionaries that were produced by then in cooperation with Oxford University. As that it happened in the era of Google translation, we had to reorganize a little, so we now deal with also other domains of <coughs> language technologies. So my point of interest is SMEs, as they are. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as I liked these t-shirts very much, and as they say, that there are also XL sizes here, so I, I would very much like to win one. So my point is rather to, oh, uh, to pose a question rather than answer to one. So my question, my main question would be, uh, 
if for, uh, for a discussion. Uh, the question for any success stories of SMEs in language te uh, technology, the success stories of SMEs getting funds from the European Commission. Well, to be quite frank, this is where I am unsuccessful. So, <laughs> this is my hope in this discussion. And my question, I also hope to win the T-shirt. Okay, and uh, sorry for me uh, mixing you up with uh, uh, Peter, who's sitting right next to me. You know, I'm getting tired as well. And um, I would also compliment your question about the SMEs uh, being successful in, uh, in uh, gaining UK funding to, to, to pose a question. First, uh, are there good, uh, big success stories of SMEs in, uh, in uh, making use of language technology or making money with language technology in general? And that's a question. That's, another, that's another good question. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, uh, sorry about this interruption, Stephen. So. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. I must confess that I did not come here with a complete research agenda for the coming uh, 20 years. I, I'm too old for that. <laughs> and. The second reason is that you know I only heard about my participation in this panel during one of the breaks today. But I, I would like to look back on this morning session that uh, Kimo could not attend, but uh, there were a few things that I remember from that. From the, the, the talk by uh, Marta from the European Commission, uh, well, she, she mentioned lots of achievements, lots of things that have been done and uh, that we had uh, uh, reached here in, in Europe, and I, well, I totally agree with that, and I think that we can be very proud of it. Those of you who've heard my talk just a few minutes ago uh, may realize that what I'm wondering about is about the, the uptake of all the wonderful things. I mean, the, the, the world is full of technology developers, but where are the users? If I just go out here in the streets, I see technology developers at every corner, but where, how many users do I find? And uh, I, because in, in a previous life, I was coordinator of ELSNET, which was uh, the, the network of excellence dedicated to uh, languages speaking, well, one of the big uh, tasks was to, to bridge the gap between academia and industry. And I know how difficult it is, and I, I really wonder whether we have found the right ways to do it. Because uh, uh, well, I, right now I'm confronted with a similar problem by uh, bringing our technology to the, the humanities scholars. And I must say that I was very pleased, Kim, in your talk you showed that the uptake was indeed an issue that you were going to take that very seriously. And <coughs> I think, for me, I have a very simple mind. I think the best way to, to achieve uptake is by very good uh, showcases, by examples that show to others what can be done, what can be achieved. Because basically human beings are imitators. They, if they see someone who's doing something in a successful way, they want to do it in the same way. So I, that's one point. The other point is the, the, the white papers, presentation of white papers. I am really wondering how the Commission will react to those white papers, because basically the picture that you get from the white papers is dramatic. There are lots of let's say, languages that are underdeveloped, and of course the Commission can say, well, we have our subsidiarity principle in the language. Kim already hinted at it in his reply to Sebastian, and uh, the language is the country's own responsibility, so why should the Commission care? Well, basically, I would hope that one day the Commission gets the brilliant idea that I had in combination with uh, companies, where they at some stage decide to make a distinction between big companies and SMEs because they realize that the SMEs could not afford the big investments uh, that would follow from the 50% uh, funding. So the SMEs got permission to uh, go for 75% funding, so they, it was less expensive for them to get involved. And I, I would hope that the Commission said, well, let's do the same thing for languages. Let's make a distinction between big language and small and medium languages, so not SME, but SML, where those companies or parties that work on those languages uh, get a special uh, bonus. For example, by uh, uh, giving them the same uh, funding that uh, SMEs would get. 75% so funding for companies that work on small languages instead of 50% uh, uh, re uh, reimbursement. So something like that, just special measures to make it attractive for industry to work on smaller languages for which they cannot expect to have a big market. Um, and what I remember from, from the, the, the impressive talks by uh, our colleagues from IBM and Google, I mean, 
when I was sitting there, I said, well, let's just stop doing languages, speech, knowledge in Europe. Let's just wait until they have invented everything and <laughs> just buy it and use it. But of course, that's something that the Commission should not do. I mean, that's just... But, but still, it would be interesting, because you know, these companies, they have uh, the advantage of, let's say, uh, brute force. Not in their methods, the methods are not brute force, but they can use any amount of resources to, to get this work done. You know, if they just uh, want a few million or a few billion more, they just invest it because they see a market for it. And that's something that we cannot do. But I would hope that uh, uh, the Commission will be able to define on the basis of the big challenges that are the basis of the Horizon Programme to, let's say, to identify, um, well, not the sort of technologies that uh, people should uh, push, because there we can never compete with the big players in the world. But let's say, uh, uh, start from problems, real problems that we encounter in our daily lives where language and speech technology could uh, offer some help. Where you would not go for, let's say, the big picture where you try to solve an enormous problem, where, where you go for, let's say, a mosaic approach, where you identify bits and pieces that together uh, give a very nice mosaic that would solve some uh, sort of societal or um, uh, other problem in the uh, community. And um, then my last uh, point is, um, uh, Kimo mentioned in his talk that um, th there was, had been very little improvement in MT over the last 10 years. So uh, every improvement is marginal. It's a, your score uh, improves by 0.00034 uh, and then you get the paper accepted at ACL because that's a very important result. Basically, I think we should now try and Kim said it, uh, create space for new approaches where you can really um, uh, hope for break breakthroughs, but it should be kept in mind, and that's something that the Commission tends to forget, that in order to support that, you really need to support foundational research, and real foundational research, not the sort of research that Roberto Tincioni used to call foundational, but the real foundation where you really reflect on things and um, not so close to application industry. <coughs> Myself and the, the audience of all the things that you mentioned, uh, one of your concerns was uh, the uptake of technologies, uh, uh, te technology transfer, especially if there's a need. Then uh, you write, okay, it showcases too much administrators, okay, interesting. Uh, you wanted to know what, what kind of re reaction the white papers have, first of all, and I'm sure Thomas is going to say something about that. He has some figures. and. Uh, Point taken about the breakthrough or uh, calling for breakthroughs, uh, then we cannot call for uh, prototypes in the same project. So, okay, uh, point taken. Thank you very much. So, Peter Reynolds. My, my name is Peter Reynolds. I'm executive director of a company called Kilgoy Translation Technologies, and it's a company that makes money out of selling translation technology. And over the last few years, we've been growing quite substantially and working reasonably successfully. I'm also the organizer of a conference called TM Europe, which is being held next week in Warsaw on Thursday and Friday of next week. Uh, and again, it comprises a lot of people that are uh, making their living out of translation. Uh, TM stands for translation management as opposed to translation memory. I, I've been involved in translation technology for quite a long time. I was one of a group of people who uh, got together to look at how, how you interchange uh, files between various different computer systems. And that eventually became XLIF. The tools that we have developed at Kilgore, NumberQ, and uh, QTerm, or whatever, if I'm at a translation industry conference, they will get mentioned in about one quarter of the presentations that are on technology, at least. Uh, I'm also an ISO, uh, a member of the ISO TC37, and uh, project editor of ISO 17100, which is on uh, translation process. I came to this conference expecting to know something about uh, what you're talking about, and maybe having met the people here, but you don't know me and I don't know you. I'm a company who makes money out of translation technology. As far as you're concerned, that's not language technology, that's translation memory stuff, that's dealing with corpuses and whatever. And this is a really appalling approach. If you're taking the view that the only 
there's only one language technology and that's machine translation, then, well, you know, you can, we will still not know each other. One of the interesting things with machine translation is that in 1964, almost 50 years ago, Bud Barhill said that to get a fully automated, quality, high quality machine translation was nearly impossible. He said it was impossible and that what we had to do was lower the standard. What has happened, in my opinion, over the last five years is we've lowered the standard too much. And we've got a situation where every student in uh, one of your classes or whatever is going in to set themselves up as a Moses expert. They're establishing a, a, a Moses implementation. We get, in, in my company, we implement uh, integrations with various different machine translation technologies. We get about one a week a request from some company that I've got Moses. And I'm not knocking them. And I, I think it's great that they're experimenting and it's whatever. What I'm saying is that the standard has gone too low and it's dangerous because what will happen is the sort of thing that Adam was hinting at in the previous thing is what happens when you know you've been teaching everybody about statistical uh, machine translation, you can tell them to go off and play with Moses, and then you come back and uh, they're told to, well, you know, look at all those Noam Chomsky books, because that's what's important. What happens when that happens? Your students will be flabbergasted. They, they won't know what's happening. I think it's a very dangerous situation. I'd like to say one of the two things we should talk about is how companies that work in industry can communicate with you because this isn't happening. There were some hints at the beginning today, but really it's not happening. And <coughs> also how we can make our overall objectives quite realistic and do something quite creative. Thank you. Together, we now have uh, 132 uh, such items ranging from uh, Denmark, Italy, uh, Hungary, uh, Finland, uh, in uh, various languages. So that uh, speaks for the efficiency of uh, such a bold statement. If you provoke uh, uh, media with uh, with the threat of uh, the national language, they uh, obviously sit up and uh, uh, report uh, widely and discuss that. Um, I know that uh, Stephen was asking about the Commission's uh, view, and uh, I have no doubt that uh, this will work its effect, I hope. And the second point that I want to make is really uh, linking up closely to because I want to address uh, the future of uh, language technology and uh, particularly from the point of view of, um, of the Commission's uh, attitude from the perspective of the languages that, uh, that I come from, Hungarian, and that uh, I represent in, in, in Metternich. Euphemistically called uh, less resourced, but uh, I mean severely under-resourced uh, and underdeveloped uh, languages. 
although there is um, some passage in, uh, in current calls which, uh, which favor the newly joined uh, languages, um, we, we do feel that there is a, a need for some, some sort of a, a positive discrimination that uh, Stephen uh, argued for. show up in um, uh, either core specially uh, dedicated to uh, bridging this technological gap that we have been uh, working against but still that exists way back from the 80s. I, I do remember there was a first wave of uh, calls uh, to develop uh, language resources in the West that opportunity was taken up by the major languages. And by the time East European uh, language technology uh, came about uh, and the theater was seen, oh well, not, not a, a yet another language resource development uh, project, no, no. So we constantly face this experience of, uh, of coming in a, in a second wave when all the exciting things have moved on. And we are left with uh, developing our own thing. And these languages are uh, such that uh, the solutions developed for uh, English, French, <coughs> German, whatever, simply do not work. You cannot take uh, them off the shelf. And this is very difficult to understand. Of course, um, from an evaluator's point of view, this may not represent groundbreaking research anymore because it was cracked for these languages. But we feel a disadvantage and left uh, to our own uh, uh, resources, very, very uh, severely limited resources, uh, to support and to catch up. So my point very shortly is uh, to drive home uh, an appreciation that this may not be groundbreaking research as you called for in, in uh, when you reviewed <coughs> the uh, expected uh, papers, but essential, essential work. And uh, if these languages are left without support, then this uh, digital single market are, is surely not to uh, come about. So, uh, so I'm, uh, let me take a bit, little bit different position, if I may. I mean, I'm, I'm just a humble linguist here, and so I'm a <laughs> scientist from, uh, from the humanities. That means that <coughs>
who scored like 11, which all of you know that he absolutely useless for humans. But computers were able to use that and then got highly precise uh, processing of sentiment analysis. On top of that, very poor rationalization, which sounds completely incredible, but it was true. I mean, it was really empirically tested. So this <laughs> might be one way of using machine translation. But um, the thing which I really wanted to say, and this is really different, is um, uh, machine translation is not scaring me. Analytics, text analytics is what scares me. Uh, uh, the, what we saw in the talk today by a Google guy, and I'm very sorry that he's not here anymore, uh, is that uh, well, the entity tracking uh, system. What do you think about your name being tracked in all your email stack messages, Facebook, Google Plus, whatever? Hmm? Then being collected, every every piece of information about your name in connection with your name, and with some with some other names in your company which you might not like, <laughs> for instance, and everything being collected and being available somewhere. And um, this is what frightens me. I mean, and then uh, we, had, we, we saw the, the, the case with uh, the example of summarization, also done by Google, where the parts of the uh, initial text were taken out. And for instance, in this, that, that was a very good example, because in this example, actually, the part that was taken out was uh, the part that was referring to the forces that did the atrocities. So the, the, the sentence that was left, the summary that was left, actually was really very neutral. It said nothing about who did what, only the, the information that something happened. So aren't we really recreating reality with such a procedure? Is it, um, there's a very <coughs> serious ethical dimension in this technology that we are building up. Aren't we actually uh, hiding the parts of reality by using automatical summarization? Automatical, I mean, we are letting the machine to decide instead of us what is relevant. In this way, actually, everything what is relevant or might be relevant will be taken. So where is the real human measure in that? So this is my uh, concern about language technologies, although I'm the one who is also building those things, and I'm really concerned from within. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, panelists. Uh, I would at this point uh, ask uh, questions uh, from the audience or uh, comments or Contest whatever whatever was said or, or said uh, give new points. I have some questions for the panelists as well. But uh, now it's time to, to win your T-shirts. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. tell me your size first. <laughs> Just to clarify, I have one. So uh, <laughs> if there will be not not, not enough T-shirts, I can I can uh, not take them. Never mind. One slide. Uh, uh, having some experience with uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, European grant proposals and uh, especially straps straps projects, uh, I observed that uh, there is a difficult there is a very difficult uh, big difficulty for an SME to become a partner in a strap project because because in the case of strap projects, there is a uh, there is a uh, expectation on the reviewer side that the strap project will have a big impact on the market. A uh, big impact on the market is associated only with big company, real company, not the research company, but real company. And that moment, only a uh, few players can can act, uh, can uh, support uh, such a strap project in Europe. There are not too, too many big companies. The SMEs are just excluded from this picture. And uh, the same is with. Uh, uh, with a, uh, uh, open access to, te to technology, uh, open access to resources. If a project uh, de uh, de de declares that the results of projects, tools, resources will be available on an open license, it's not 
uh, considered as a impact on the market. <coughs> it is they are really true open. They can if they can change the, the whole shape of the, of the business. The delivery tools to, to everyone. So I, I, I would like to ask you what what uh, how could we be uh, solved if, uh, in the case of, of this uh, project linking uh, universities and and companies. Uh, how to open the possibility for smaller companies and how to promote uh, uh, open access to, to technology that can change the, the whole market, the, the whole society. Maybe that was the question to you. <laughs> or I at least feel obliged to uh, uh, answer and say something about that. Uh, what, what you say about difficulties of SME to accessing uh, funding programs is, is very true. It starts actually already from the difficulty of finding the time to write a proposal, uh, which is much more difficult for companies where everybody uh, is already working 16 hours a day trying to uh, serve the clients uh, and, and make a living of, of that. So it's, a, it's really uh, something that uh, acknowledged fact. And, uh, say about difficulties of uh, convincing the evaluators that, that an SME can have an impact. Uh, it, it, it can be true, but um, I would be, it would be unfair to, towards the evaluators to say that systematically, systematically that, that they, they think that this is small company, it has no impact. Uh, I take an example from the SME uh, call that we ran uh, last year that we are repeating. SME call, uh, the impact was basically that it is uh, measured by the potential of reuse of, uh, of data, linguistic data, language resources, uh, or, or services uh, by SMEs, so by other SMEs. So it was a sort of multiplication scheme. And I think that probably is, is, a, is a good idea uh, to avoid this misunderstanding about the SME program. It's not about uh, just having two SMEs in the consortium, which is the requirement. And that's not the point with the SME program. It's about rolling out solutions that can be used, uh, as, as Stephen said, as showcases for SMEs to imitate, actually, to do the same thing in their uh, respective markets. That, that's the impact. And then, if, if an evaluator says that, that this has no impact, then that evaluator anymore a uh, second time because I mean, that's exactly uh, you know by showing uh, a model a business uh, practice model uh, with your SME to others that they could imitate it and uh, do the same in, in their businesses I mean, that's that's really tough and we, we try to address also this proposal writing uh, problem uh, in, in the SME call uh, that we have now maximum length of the proposal uh, has been uh, limited to 20 pages. You, it, you are not allowed to write more than 20 pages. Uh, we realized that, you know, we tried to limit this before. We said that we gave uh, sort of uh, guidelines that ideally a proposal should not be more than 50 pages. We received always 100, 100 120 pages, even from SMEs. So then we thought, okay, we changed now the, the, the strategy and we say, if we receive more than 20 pages from you, uh, your uh, uh, submission is ineligible. We will not evaluate. That works better. So now, uh, uh, now we use it. That, uh, we limit the workload uh, proposal writing by limiting the number of pages. Of course, that's very crude method, and that is, but it's easily uh, easy to put in practice. Uh, okay. I, I hope this. I'd just like to add something of our experience because we're an SME that were part of the consortium which won FP7 funding in, in the last round. And our, our view is we will not touch it unless it's something that we see is very close to our competence, that we understand the partners. One of the things that attracted us about this particular uh, um, proposal was that it was being led by a company in Latvia 
until that we we worked with the four, and, and we felt comfortable about working with them. And the fact that the two SMEs had got that relationship was quite. <coughs> but we 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 were we're not interested in uh, this funding because it just unless it's exactly what we're, we're doing and matches our confidence and will help the company grow. Uh, and, and it's dangerous. Government funding of different types can be very dangerous for a uh, company. We're a Hungarian company who got uh, quite a lot of funding at the beginning from the Hungarian government. Two years ago, the Hungarian government changed and the new Hungarian government went through every single uh, grant uh, that they had done to every single SME. And quite a lot of it was clawed back. In our case, it was clawed back. In our case, it didn't matter because by the time they clawed it back, we were financially stable. But some companies went out of business here. And you know, that's not the way to fund uh, small, medium enterprises. It's fine if you're funding co co corporation or somebody, but it can destroy small companies. Thank you for the t-shirt. I got already one, so two weeks I will do, I hope. Uh, and uh, I got rather a remark and a question. Uh, and the conference mentioned uh, next weekend I will have a speech about why uh, spell checkers. I took it as an example. I'm not as good as I could be because there is a lot of technology around one can apply and nobody is doing it. And the reason is uh, market doesn't really need excellence. Market needs, uh, uh, as for speech uh, processing, uh, for text processing, market needs good enough solutions because there is no need on the consumer side because consumers, I, I, we went through two successful FP6 uh, and FP5 projects and uh, we have great results and we have no customers for this advanced technology because uh, it was extremely easy to explain them why they should use it. It's so good that they do not need it really. Uh, so it's a kind of a problem. I'm not talking, uh, I'm not mentioning the financial uh, problems of SME. For example, I cannot take a loan from the bank because I finished uh, three years ago or four years ago, I finished the uh, FP7 project and now I'm depreciating uh, my costs. So, so I'm in red already. Yeah? Uh, and so on and so on. So it's, uh, I think, uh, a lot of problems uh, from the real world rather from the from the structure of uh, of the world. Yes, so, so so they are they are because of the fact that uh, so far science is far ahead. Real social needs of applying uh, linguistic technology, from my point of view. Thank you. Any more? and we have to go through this uh, geography in the last project. And uh, <clears throat> yes, it is hard to get uh, this funding, but the uh, most difficult issue is to figure out this uh, idea and persuade other uh, companies or universities to, to be involved with. And if you can do that, then you can persuade the commission as well that it's useful. And you need to say this idea clearly. I'm just saying, okay, it will work. Let's say why and how. So just come on. Questions, more questions? Do you still have shirts? I don't have a question for the panelists. 
and then I don't have either a proposition uh, uh, that uh, I can put forward that is different or is uh, making some 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 um, debate or dispute from, from whatever I, I said so far. Uh, what I'd like to add <coughs> to do is to call the attention for for uh, an aspect that has not been addressed yet, and to my mind is perhaps one of the uh, most important uh, issues because we spend all our time, or most of it, uh, trying to, to find the right balance uh, between uh, research and innovation and development and uptake and who should contribute to what. So the researchers should, should really come closer to companies, but no, 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 it should be the companies that should come closer to academy, so that academy should uh, really concentrate on uh, their, their, their job, which is to create knowledge, not to create money, and so on and so on. But actually, I think, in the end, we are missing an important dimension of, uh, that, that is really constraining our field, our, our, our area of, of uh, activity, which is uh, what, and that is happening outside our, our, our power and our that it's outside the limits of our action. And it has to do with the fact how, how the market, the, the, the world market is shaped by a very, very big player like Google, which really uh, produces a kind of a de desert, desert around, around it, okay? So just put yourself in the place of a, a young, uh, just graduate uh, guy coming out of university uh, in Europe. Why should he or she just bet on, on making up a company, betting on language technology, when, when she will uh, really compare the chances uh, she will have uh, to have success in face of the competition really uh, provided or really uh, presenting, being presented by Google. So Google is a kind of a monopolist uh, actor or, or, or uh, player that really, really is hindering, hindering small initiatives that really could flourish and could open the way to, uh, well, a more diversified landscape uh, in business terms. And this I don't think we can really change, though we really have, I mean in Europe, though we really have very, very strong instruments. I mean, the support by the Commission and all these programs uh, fostering language technology either on the research side or in the innovation side are perhaps the best thing or the, the, the strongest instrument that we can see all around the world really to, to foster language technology. And still we are facing with huge, huge difficulty. I don't really know uh, how to get out of this. Uh, the only thing we all know is that the lesson that history uh, teaches, nothing will stay like it is forever. So this will change, I'm sure, and we are sure. Uh, how can we contribute for that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe we need to wait for a new age of technological innovation so that we can serve that technological uh, innovation so that new big players can, can show up and really then really promote in a different way language technology uh, on, on, on top of that. But. Uh, Anyway, the, the message uh, from my talk is that maybe we should also uh, give uh, sufficient attention for, for this uh, uh, constraint and this, this uh, real situation around us and not pretending that Google and the other guys like Google, but especially Google is not there. I agree with you entirely. I think Google's problem, one of the things I think was quite interesting is that 12 years ago, 13 years ago, a lot of technology around checking which uh, country the person was from first came in. So it became good practice when designing a, a, a website to check what language the person was from, offer them 
the website or heard the website, often the website in that language. And if they wanted to, they could change it. And also, it would be possible to figure out, because the, the, the words change your language would change every so often uh, that you click on if you decide to change language. The, the good practice 13 years ago, or whatever it was, to allow people to change that. When Google became more, uh, you know, more popular, they brought in this idea that, uh, you know, they'll decide. You, how many people here are visiting Warsaw and have tried to use a browser and wanted to change it to Hungarian or French or whatever? You know, where do you find change your language on a Google browser? And it's a very simple interface. And this bad practice has been become, become the standard. And it's because a company the size of Google has it. I think that's the negative side. And the other side of, the, of it is that let's not be too worried by them. Uh, when they brought out translation, translation toolkit, we were quite concerned for a while that this is going to cause a major change. They didn't. What happened was the translator said, well, we'd like to be able to see um, the results from the <coughs> translation within the window that we're using in your tool in MSQ. And that's what they've got. And that's what they've got in our competitors' tools. Um, and you know, it hasn't been the, that hasn't been the cause of any problem to, uh, you know, to us. Uh, if you've got students or whatever that want to set up a translation technology company, worrying about Google is not uh, the, the problem. The, what, what they need to have is something really clever to, uh, to sell to people. And they need to understand that the people out there are very, very well educated, very, very discerning users who have spent, you know, translators who people in this room will have never heard of, have spent years uh, looking at the nuances of all sorts of different translation tools and different methodologies and whatever. And these users are very, very sophisticated. They know what they want. And that's the challenge for your, uh, uh, for your student wants to set a company rather than competing with Google. And I think that's a much more exciting challenge because you want opinionated customers who will kick you when you're uh, doing something that's not quite right. You want them to be able to know what they want so that they can help shape the tools that you're developing. But, you know, Google, I think, we're limited as to what we can do about it, but I don't think we should worry. You know, we shouldn't let the fact that there's a giant uh, in the highway stop us going forward. language native speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
First of all, uh, I cannot see any problem in, in funding machine translation, particularly that our company deals with it, so it looks a stated idea. Uh, but, uh, but my, my suggestion is a, is a bit different. Uh, well, my observation is that uh, large companies are happy to cooperate uh, with either private persons or uh, uh, ac <coughs> academies. Well, when there is someone from a large company that wants to make a deal with me, well, I say, well, I am, well, I can represent three legal entities: myself, university, or SME. Which one you prefer? So, the the usual answer is the, the order is either university or private person, SME is always third. So when I, when I question, when I, when I try to, 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 to understand the situation, the answer is always the copyrights. So somehow, somehow, well, this is my experience, that somehow, somehow large companies would not cooperate with SMEs because of the copyright matters. So m my suggestion is, is, it, is there any possibility of the European funding so that it would incorporate large companies into the programs, not only SMEs, and the large companies would be helped for, for example, buying copyrights from SMEs. That's a very good su suggestion, uh, and in general, uh, I would want to, to avoid any confrontation uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, classifying companies uh, small and big, uh, small against big, or public against private in general, so rather to see them as, as partners and partnerships, and partnerships also derive from uh, business relations. Today, a gentleman came uh, at the expo asking me a question about is it possible for a large co company to participate in the SME call as a member of the consortium? And I said, yes, of course. Uh, there is no, absolutely no rule against that. Uh, and it can be very desirable. Uh, it's just that there are minimal participation rules. You must have at least two SMEs in, in the consortium. The other partners can be large companies, and actually, it's, it can be very beneficial uh, to uh, stimulate this, this kind of uh, uh, cooperation. There has been less talk about uh, partnership between uh, small and large companies, more uh, discussion about public and private or research and industry. So, but I take the point. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
privacy uh, is that, uh, to, to what extent should privacy issues be part of the business strategy? And for example, this principle of uh, uh, privacy by design, uh, which, which is about handling privacy issues by technology design rather than regulatory, regulatory approach. Very often the regulatory approach fails, and it's, it's too difficult to control what is happening on the internet. But what if there are technological Thank you very much.